Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, everybody, to episode 36 of the Ad Nauseam podcast. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle. I'm here in the Vomitorium with my good friend and co-host, Dr. David Noe. How are you doing, Dave, today? I have to admit, Jeff, I'm a little bit on edge. You know, I felt that coming in. On the way over? Yeah. I feel like there's going to be some airing of grievances. There may be. All right. Mm -hmm. So do I need to be like Little Mary Sunshine today to try to balance this out? Can you do that? How dark is this going to be? I can't say, really. The weather has turned... Michigan, in this part of the woods, you yes. might say. It's gorgeous right now, though. Look at that out there. That's yeah. because it's out there, and oh. we're in here. Okay, all right, all right. Bring it down. Bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> Captain, bring down. Yep. Yeah, well, you know, we're still waiting on summer. We uh, are. Classes have ended. I have finished distributing all of my grades and assignments and so forth. We still have exams coming up. Okay. So that'll be this week. So you feel a little bit of a weight of that? I mean, I always feel that, too. I, the exam week is always, a, it's a pile. Right. Well, I have pushed off some of the exams till later in the week to try to give the students maximum amount of time to finish their tests That's and so forth. very kind of you. Yeah. Well, what can I say? Yeah. And then there's going to be an avalanche. Yes. Of, uh, a deluge. A deluge. Yes. Right. So these are the antediluvian times I'm living in right now. Okay. All right. And then it's all going to just drop all at once. Okay. You're feeling the... The weight and... A, a pending gloom, you yeah, might I say. I got you. I got you. I feel you. All right. All right. Let's Come, that. Uh, add that into my basic undercurrent of misanthropy. And, <laughs> it's a it's a dark, it's a heady brew. A little what, bit. What it is. Yep, some well, you know, tang. The, um, the, yeah, the, uh, the subject matter today is, is pretty dark too. I don't know how we're going to... This is right in my wheelhouse. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So you're going to, you're going to find your way right into this. Exactly. Okay. We've okay, got good. Melanthius. We've got retributive justice. Yes. There's a lot going on Lots here. of bloodshed and... Well, I'm not so and, crazy about that, but we'll see what happens. You have the shout out, don't you? Is, uh, it's mine today. Yes. Yeah, so a shout out goes today to uh, Amy Drake Silvasi, uh, former student of both of us. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, it, just a, a wonderful young woman. I always loved having her in class. So did I. Just, Charming, talented, hard worker. Yep. Curious. And so and and she's been listening to the podcast. Uh, oh. Perhaps most important of all. So. Is, that's why she's getting the shout out, you might say. Yeah, exactly right. Yes. And she sent us this this little snippet. She writes, I've really been enjoying the podcast, especially episode 28. I don't remember what, which, what one that was. That was Susan. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the discussion of healthcare related topics in antiquity. Okay. The second part of that sentence would have answered my question. Right. That's okay. okay. I'm a newly graduated registered nurse. Uh, we, uh, she's recently married. Yes. Uh, currently live in Dexter, Michigan, but are relocating to Oregon in a few weeks. That might be a, a good move. I think so. Yeah. Does the podcast reach Oregon? Is there reception out there? It, the, well, the radio tower on the top of the vomitorium is it's a 50, it's massive. 50,000 watt blower. Okay. Yeah. So it bounces off the trees and so forth. And Yes, exactly okay. right. So she, she goes on, she's been applying to jobs out in Oregon and I'm hoping to work in the neurosurgical ICU setting. Sounds very good. We need, we need uh, classically informed people in all all walks of life. That's we? right. Yeah. We do. Yeah. So hello, Amy. Thank you so much. Yes. And Jeff, you have today's quote as I'll take, well. I'll take the quote today. Wow, too. you're just firing on all cylinders. Right. Um, when reading these books, I was thinking about this uh, slim book by Margaret Atwood, the, the Penelope Ad. Have you heard of this? No. No? It's a it's it's quite an interesting take. And so um, the Penelope Ad, I, I once in a myth class assigned this. And it's a kind of a version of the end of the Odyssey from the viewpoint of Penelope. Mm-hmm. And um, the thing that that um, kind of hit Margaret Atwood. She's probably most famous for her book, The Handmaid's Tale, and and such. Is that the hanging of the maids, which we'll talk about today, really bothered her and didn't really understand it, kind of how it fit into the, kind of the even these ancient ideas of justice as Homer presents them. Okay, and so that was kind of the that was kind of her hook, and it kind of drove her to write this this, right. this version. So this quote comes from a article called Rewriting the Odyssey by a a scholar named Mihoko Suzuki, and she writes, Atwood's most striking innovation in the Penelope ad is to bring to the center the maids of Odysseus who were executed by their master upon his return. As she states in the introduction, I've always been haunted by the hanged maids, and in the Penelope ad, so was Penelope herself. By contrast, Homer's Odyssey appears to accept their fate without a scruple. Hmm. So I I, I like this idea. I like asking this question, um, at least challenging the question of, Looking at the end of the Odyssey, and is it as kind of a clear-cut moral good and bad? I think as it's often taken, 
And so uh, I, I'm hoping today we kind of explore that from, you know, what would an ancient Greek audience have thought? Right. And you know, how much are we injecting our own kind of Judeo-Christian morality onto hmm. the end? And, and how, do we, how do we navigate that? Okay. So we're going to get right at each other today, aren't we? We are. I, yes, you're kind of, you're, 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 your eyes are narrowed. Yeah, I've begun the grimace early in the episode. <laughs> you have, exactly right. So this is it. This is the climax, right? We're almost at the end. Yes. We have got one more episode on the Odyssey yeah, after this. We'll wrap it up next week. 23, yep. 24. And then what does it all mean? That kind of a question. Right. And I think look, the audience have, and we have been on an Odyssey. This yes. Is, this is multi-part episodes. And yeah, there may be a little bit of Odyssey fatigue. Oh, yeah, I don't think so. You it, don't? Well, uh, maybe. I, I think that um, I think the feedback from these episodes have been has been quite, it has been fantastic, been quite positive. And um, but I, I think you and I are both eager to get onto other topics. There's Correct. so much so much stuff we want to cover. Yeah. So all the planning, the scheming, the limited revelations, the omens, they all come down to this. Really, this is it. This yep. is it. The uh, the contest of the bow. We've got that in uh, book twenty one. Before that, in book twenty, we've got omens and prophecies. Yep. Then we have the slaughter in yeah. 22. It gets really dark. The big fight scene. Just because the gods sanction this action, and in fact, Athena comes right down and stands next to Odysseus and Telemachus and Eumaeus and Philoetius, cowherd, swineherd, kid. Uh, Athena sanctions it. She fights on their behalf. Does that mean that everything they do is morally justified? Well, it's going to be interesting to, uh, to, to get down to it. I think that um, you would say... Short answer to that, yes. Right. right. Yeah? Yeah. And I would say, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Right. We'll, we'll take that apart, right? Does everything Odysseus do at the end, is it um, a proper victory for this returning king? Mm-hmm. Could he have done things differently? And what would an ancient audience have thought of these things? And um, how does a modern audience, what do they bring to it that might change the perspective. Right. Well, let's get right into it. And let's begin with a little bit of Greek from book 20 and then follow that up with a little bit of Lombardo. Sounds great. You got it? Yes, in fact, I do. So here are the first four lines of book 20. Autohranen prodomo el nazatatias adusos, kam men adepse ton boa ains to resautar hu purthe, ko e apol o ion tus hi reues conakaioi. El rumone darapi klainan balakoi methenti. Very nice. Well, thank you. You know there are two things I don't take well. Uh, yes, it's a praise and criticism. Praise and criticism. Right. <laughs> Other than that, I'm fine with anything else you might say. I, do you want me to try to kind of thread that needle, that find, that, find the middle path today? <laughs> You're quite an accomplished musician. You ought to bring in your uh, guitar at some point. Oh, yeah. We could strum along, sing along. Do you think that the, the folks would like that or that would just be... Ter- I don't send think they have running. any choice. Once they get into the center of the podcast, they're trapped. They're trapped. It's they're a labyrinth. <laughs> it's a Cretan labyrinth. Yes, there's, uh, they, they have very little chance of finding their own way out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Dave, can you translate those lines for us that you just read? Sure. This is uh, Lombardo, of course. Odysseus lay down to sleep on the outer porch. He spread out an uncured ox hide, and on top of that, he layered fleeces from the many sheep that were always being slaughtered there in his house. Sounds uncomfortable. It does, but, you know, he doesn't want to sleep inside, remember? He moves his couch, his, uh, his little setup, from the, inside the palace into out in the courtyard. Right. All to further the disguise. Correct. Right, into, and not to, so as not to arouse suspicion. That's right. Right. So I don't know the difference between sleeping on a cured versus an uncured oxide, but uh, I'd, probably, it, I'd choose cured if I had a choice. I think right? it would affect the smell. Oh, there you go. An uncured oxide that might gather mold a yeah, little bit. It sounds, it sounds disgusting. Like sleeping on a piece of blue cheese, probably. <laughs> oh, nasty. You don't want that. No, you do not. But it goes on directly from this. While he's sleeping there, remember, then the women of the house come out. And Odysseus has to have a a little talk with himself, a little heart to heart. Do you remember this? Oh, this is where he kind of chomping at the bit to get this thing going. To wreak vengeance. Yes. The vengeance is there and he wants to wreak it. But then he talks to his shaggy heart and says words to the effect that, look, you suffered through the Cyclops. Yeah. You were there and you watched your men be eaten, dear heart. So you can endure a little bit of uh, insult That's from right. these maids. Just bide your time. Don't be too quick to reveal the plot. You can take your vengeance later. Yeah. As, the, as we noted in an earlier episode, these moments where we get some of this inner dialogue, this inner monologue of, of Odysseus, they're rare. Hmm. And, we, and uh, he's saying things to himself that maybe in a previous book, or maybe in an epic like the Iliad, it would be Athena speaking to him, Definitely. saying these things. So we'll move away from a strict dialogue for, 
for revealing character to a little more of the monologue, the inner indeed perspective. Indeed, it also we, we get this piling up of of omens and signs. I mean, everything is kind of uh, pushing the the audience to to um, feeling, okay, something big is, is about to happen. Something divinely orchestrated in particular. Right. So in previous books we had, you know, Penelope talks about this weird dream that she has. Telemachus's sneeze is taken as an omen. In book 20, there's a, there's a thunderclap. Um, again, the gods kind of presenting themselves in these indirect kinds of ways. The thunderclap, and then there's an interpretation, an unwitting interpretation given by this woman who is grinding grain. Remember that? Oh, yeah. How, how does that, well, how does that go? Well, she's standing at a window, and Homer tells us that she and the other maids had to grind grain uh, each day into flour in order to make food for these hungry, ravenous suitors. Right. And she's the slowest at the task, and so everyone else is left. She's the only one remaining. And uh, she's very angry and frustrated and disgusted with the task. So when she hears the thunderclap, she prays to Zeus and says uh, words to the effect that, may this be the last day I have to, you know, be stuck with this and we finally get these suitors out of my house, out of Odysseus's house. Right, right. Which he overhears, Odysseus overhears, and he smiles because he realizes there is the unwitting interpretation of Zeus's thunderclap. Yeah, it's um, these lower characters, the the characters in the kind of a knob, the bottom of the social totem pole who are almost given a kind of divine insight in these, in these moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is a, a comic archetype. So Jeff, in addition to the main characters with whom everyone is familiar, Penelope, Odysseus, Telemachus, these minor characters, they now step forward on the stage. Yeah. So Eumaeus, the, the noble swineherd, he has been a, a pivotal part of the action for the last several books, hatching the plot with Odysseus, extending it, Eurycleia, the nurse, but then we have Melantheus. We've got to talk about him a little bit more. Yeah. And then Philoetius, the cow herd. Right. Melantheus is, uh, is the goat herd. The goat herd. Yeah. You can never trust a goat herd. No. Philoetius, cow herd, he is, uh, how did you express it? He starts to see maybe the the disguise of Odysseus falling off a little bit. Yeah. Or it gets kind of an inkling that the beggar, there is more to this beggar. And I think it's one of those instances where these people that are good, of, pure of heart, good of character, they have some insight that these other characters don't. And so he starts to get it. And I think that Lombardo says words to the effect that um, Philoetius speaks to the beggar and says, you know, you, you may have been a king once. You have a kind of yeah. a, a kingly demeanor under the rags and so forth. And that's a, a signal that um, Philoetius is going to be, he's going to be okay. He's going to be he, all right. Right. And yeah. he has missed his master for, for many, many years. Mm-hmm. He's taking care of the cattle, the Cephalenian cattle, as yes. Lombardo says. Uh, and he just wishes that... Odysseus could come back and put things to right. There's a tremendous longing for justice to be worked yes. in the home. Yeah, we see that from Eumaeus and Eurycleia very uh, clearly, too. And this is the angle I'm going to use when I push back against your <laughs> complexifying of yes. was it wrong to mm-hmm. to, uh, to execute the maids? Was it wrong mm-hmm. to bring such harsh justice on Melanthius? And yes. I'm going to argue, no, it wasn't, because these are the persons who have made Eumaeus, Telemachus, Philoetius, Eurycleia, Penelope made them all suffer so much. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get, see. We'll get to that. All we'll right. see. All right. Now there's another omen. Yes. Those are the suitors see an eagle flying on their left. Oh, not good. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's exa- so things on the left, bad. Things happening on your right, good. And this is while the suitors are plotting Telemachus's death. Yes. Right. Which is another um, very good reason. Uh, to to take them out. I think maybe in, in some ways the best reason uh, that Odysseus has perhaps to to slaughter them. They're planning to kill his own son. Oh, to, yes, to prevent the murder of his son. Yes. And Amphinomus. Remember that guy? Yes, the guy that you tried to say was not as bad as he appears. I'm still maybe. saying that. Yeah. All right. I, f- I feel a little sorry for him because he's, I think the phrase that Lombardo uh, uses, translates is he's pinned by Athena. Yes, Athena pins him. The, once they once the, these guys agree uh, to kind of take part in the in the party, mm-hmm. they're they're doomed. Yes. So wrong place, wrong time is not an excuse. No, not from Athena's point of view. No, he's pinned. He's stuck. So in, and here and again, Amphinomus gets a uh, a deeper hint of what's coming, and he right. knows that he can't escape. Yeah. Now, also in this book, in book twenty, uh, there's a scene that's quite reminiscent, maybe even copied by uh, Virgil in book two of his Aeneid, you know, the fall of Troy, where we have uh, Laocoon at the altar slaughtering the bull. Yes. Uh, He's the priest of Neptune. And then a little bit later, Laocoon himself 
is consumed by the snakes, which Minerva sent. Yes. So here we have this juxtaposition outside. There's a, a sacrifice of bulls to Apollo mm-hmm. and inside what's taking place. There's um, the, what the big, the big feast. It's a, a shadow. Outside is, a, is, a, is something sacred is happening. And it's inside the wall, something profane is mm-hmm. taking place. But they both involve a kind of slaughter, slaughter. and consumption. Yes, right. I also think it's interesting that um, Apollo and Artemis, while they don't show up as characters here, uh, they're part of the action. Penelope has this dream. Um, what she has a dream. It's a prayer. It's a prayer right. to to Artemis, and, and, uh, and Apollo is being worshipped. So you have these. It makes me think of. Um, one of the rare times where that brother sister team mm-hmm. um, they they gun down with their arrows the children of Niobe. That's right. And I, th- I think we're supposed to be put in that mindset right? that so this these, is what's coming. These archer deities are also behind this. That's a really interesting uh, observation. So the fact that these archer this archer god Apollo and uh, his sister Artemis that that they're in the background. Mm-hmm. This sets us up for the the great shooting that comes on Odysseus's part. Right. Not just the drawing of the bow, but killing all the suitors uh, with his arrows. Yeah. Would you say it's it's meant to um, make someone quiver? Ooh, man. Okay, I'm seeing the old Dave coming through. <laughs> this this is good. I, I'm 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 happy to hear it. Yeah. Tell us about Ctesippus. <laughs> Ctesippus, um, aside from being very difficult, difficult to pronounce, because it's yeah. got that that capital at the beginning. Ctesippus. Ctesippus. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not even gonna bother. He's Again, in the hall, he's annoyed that the beggar is uh, getting an equal amount of food that, that he's getting. Because as the feast begins, Telemachus insists that this old man, Odysseus mm-hmm. in disguise, get a goodly portion of beef and uh, or, or goat and a goodly portion of wine. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Zania again, to, right. a, to a T. And this guy doesn't like it. Why, does it. why should a beggar get this? You know, so I'm he a, says, try out this gift, basically. Yeah, and, and he, he chucks an ox hoof at him. Mm. Right. How many things have been chucked at the beggar now? This is what, it was a footstool yep. and an ox I think two footstools. My count, that's two. Two, two, foot, two footstools, I okay. think. And then now an ox hoof is just laying around. Right. Which gives you kind of a sense of what the hall must look like at this point. It's just parts of animals just like scattered about. Typical university dorm room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he dodges, Odysseus does, and the hoof lodges in the wall. Yes. It breaks through the, the drywall. That's going to be a pain to fix. That is. You're going to have to get one of those patch and putty. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> the beggar, too, again, showing dexterity and reflexes that a beggar, a beggar of his age should not and have. And his decrepitude. Yes, should not have. Right. Theoclymenus, your yeah. favorite prophet. He makes an appearance here, an important appearance. Yeah. So this guy, if you remember, I, I, I don't like, I don't like this guy the way he shows up. If our audience remembers, he's the one who shows up where Telemachus is about to leave the mainland and go back to Ithaca after his little trip to uh, Pelos and Sparta, and he's a some, he's a wanted murderer. And Telemachus says, "Hey, come along. We got a spot for you. Grab an oar." And so it just seems a little, you know. Why? Why did this guy get added? A bit to, of a stretch. Add to the cast, but I see. I see his his purpose now. He becomes kind of the the human voice added to these omens, and so he breaks out in prophecy. But um, wouldn't the gods choose someone like this, who's unexpected, someone who's got some? He's morally compromised a little bit, and not thought to be the the mouthpiece of the gods to be really speaking the truth. Kind of like in line with Cassandra, right? Mm. I mean, Cassandra is not a person who's morally compromised, but she spoke the truth and it was not believed. So there's a sense of irony involved in that. Yeah, I like that. And I no. think that's probably why Theoclymenus is portrayed this way. Yeah, I mean, that's. No, I like that. That's really interesting. And then also, as someone whom uh, you know, the suitors don't know, it's very easy for them to also just dis- dismiss him and disregard him, right? Like, well, right. who's this guy, right? Just another tag along, like like the beggar. You've got a so, quote for us, don't you I, hear, from Theoclymenus? I do. And this is the quote that actually made me change my mind a little bit okay. about him, right? And so uh, after all this is, is, is going on, he utters a prophecy. He says, uh, wretches, what wicked thing is this that you suffer? You are shrouded in night from top to toe. Lamentation flares, your cheeks melt with tears, and the walls of the house are spattered with blood. The porch and the court are crowded with ghosts streaming down to the undergloom. The sun is gone from heaven, and an evil mist spreads over the land. Hmm. That's so, good stuff. So he's seeing the future. He is. He's seeing that. It's, it's, you mentioned Cassandra, uh, like in Aeschylus's play Agamemnon, seeing the slaughter that awaits both Agamemnon and herself. Right. Right. It's, it's very much like this. And so this is a better prophecy than his early earlier quips. This is this is dark. This is heavy. This is horror movie stuff. Okay. Yeah. 
And but, how do the suitors respond? Yeah, they just they giggle and smirk. Hmm. Dismissive. Yeah. Well, either way, Jeff, if you're not too fond of Theoclimenus, after all, you don't have to worry because he's about to exit the scene. He's, he's out of here. Yes, this comes at the end of book 20. And uh, he says, I'll leave under my own power when the suitors are intending to get rid of him. For I can see evil coming upon you, inescapable evil, for every last one of you who in your blind pride do violence to the house of Odysseus. And with that, he left the great hall. And he went to Piraeus, who took him in gladly. And so he's, he's gone. He's gone. Yeah. Right. By now, this, so this is the end of book 20. This yeah. is Lombardo. It's a, it's a brilliant translation. I've really grown to love it. He says, by now Penelope, Acarius' wise daughter, had set her chair across from the suitors and heard the words of each man in the hall. During all their laughter, they had been busy preparing their dinner, a tasty meal for which they had slaughtered many animals. Now, these, of course, are the animals that belong to Odysseus the constant eating of his property and the uh, ogling of his wife and the threatening of his son. Then to return here to the translation, but no meal could be more graceless than the one a goddess and a hero would serve to them soon. After all, they started the whole ugly business. Ah, that's great stuff. So that's the line, right? They started the whole Whole ugly ugly business. business. So they're having this feast in his home, but the feast that's going to come in the next two books is Odysseus and Athena feasting on their corpses, you might say. Yeah. Isn't that, it, that is so interesting? It, you know, as you're reading that, um, it reminds me of that famous letter that Cicero writes um, after, yes. after the Ides of March. And he says something like, you know, I wish I would have been invited to that feast. Yes. I yeah. think that it's in, um, I think it might be mentioned in Deo Ficiis also. Oh, really? The assassination of Caesar. You know, that was a, a sumptuous banquet yeah. I didn't get to attend. Yeah, yeah, It yeah. can't be more grisly than that. Yeah. All right, it's Cyclopean, actually. Yeah, and there's a lot of Greek myth that, that centers around uh, kind of horrible, profane meals. You think of like like Thyestes. That's and, right. Like, like the cannibal the children of I- Thyestes' children. Thyestes' Kill- children, yes. yes. Killed by Aegeus. Yes. Someone should make a podcast, you know, which has a kind of a gusto. Oh, oh man. Did we, did we start this, this <laughs> we stepped, ugly business? We stepped into it. After all, <laughs> it says at the end of book 20, they started the whole ugly business. Yeah. To which ugly business we will happily return after the break. This week's episode is brought to you by Adastra Coffee, the coffee that takes you to the stars, but it doesn't end run around the peraspora, the difficult part. Yes, we are thrilled to have Ad Astra Roasters on board here at Ad Nauseam. Specialty coffee, veteran-owned out of Hillsdale, Michigan, just a couple hours away from here. The, from the vomitory? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the fine people at Ad Astra have been roasting beans for years. We don't know how many, but even a part of a year counts. At first, just for themselves, but now their high-quality bed and drum roasted goodness is available for everyone. As their owner, Patrick Whalen, puts it, our goal is to create extraordinary quality in the cup, value for our producers and customers, and strong local communities. So, Ad Nauseam friends, what's in it for you? You can go to oddostraroasters.com, oddostra, A-D-A-S-T-R-A, roasters.com, and check out some of their delicious, high-quality offerings. You get a special 10% off by entering A-N-A-A in the coupon code box, and you can also sign up for their monthly subscription. You definitely got to check it out. Check out the Tenebris especially. We both love it. Check Indeed. it out. Odd nows and to your attention, please. Mark Helwig and the Portland-based crew at Ratio Coffee have done it. Don't throw your francs, euros, bitcoin, drachmas, or dollars down the drain at some overpriced suburban Bob, Bob's Barn of Beans. <laughs> <laughs> Try <laughs> <laughs> Bob's Barn O' Beans. Yes. Now, you wrote that line. I, I didn't. Did. I know I did. Okay. I, I was stumbling all over it. But uh, that not was Danny. Try one of Ratio's twin powerhouses, the Ratio 6 or the Big Brother, the 8. You can have better than cafe quality beverages right from your countertop. That's right, Jeff. I love my Ratio 8 in oyster with the walnut accents. It's a part of my daily ritual. I wake, I grind, I bloom, and effervesce. Then I brew and boom, ready. The bloom stage is where the magic happens, banishing all the CO2 to the farthest corners of Tartarus and sending a cascade of 200 degree Fahrenheit water through my favorite Ad Astra grounds down into the durable stainless steel carafe. Look, even if you failed high school chemistry, Winkle, did you fail high school chemistry? It was, it was close. Okay. You can't go wrong with this automatic pour over, perfectly timed, aesthetically excellent, consistent coffee. Jeff, how can our listeners add some ratio magic to their day? All right, listeners, right now you can go to ratiocoffee.com, R-A-T-I-O coffee.com, and get an exclusive 15% discount on the Ratio 6. Enter special code A-N-C-O for 15% off the Ratio 6, A-N-C-O ratiocoffee.com. Who knew? So true. Bring the Bloom Zoom brew home to you. 
Check it out. This episode of Ad Nauseam is also brought to you in part by Hackett Publishing. An independent publisher since 1972, Hackett has been bringing the best of classics and humanities to a wide audience with affordable, attractive offerings. Well, Dave, I know you like to read philosophy. Is that true? Yeah, I've heard that. I do you. enjoy that. Yeah. Yes. Well, what does Hackett have for you in that vein? Oh, that vein is rich, Jeff. It stretches for miles. The gold in those hills includes Aristotle, a new CDC Reeve translation called The Hackett Aristotle. I'm looking forward to that very much. Some of those volumes are already out. The series includes new translations of all of Aristotle's works. And that's just a small piece of what uh, Hack has to offer. Absolutely. They have uh, many, many titles um, across Greco-Roman history and outside of Greco-Roman history, ancient Rome, translations of Suetonius, Livy, and much more. That's right, Jeff. Can you tell our listeners how they can score some of these savings? I can. All right, AN crew, right now you can save 20% on any order and receive free shipping from Hackett Publishing. All you have to do is go to hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, publishing.com, find the text you want, and enter AN2021 in the box, which asks for the coupon code. Don't hesitate. Check out hackettpublishing.com today. All right, so it's on to book 21, The Contest of the Bow. Set yeah. this up for us, will you, Dr. Winkle? Right, so um, it all kind of comes down to this. So if you remember back, uh, book 19, after Penelope tells her dream to the beggar, she immediately announces this contest and says, all right, this is gonna, we're going to bring this to a close. And the one of you who can string my husband's bow and shoot an arrow through the eyelets of these I think it's 12 axes. What's an eyelet? Like, so the, these axes where, they, uh, where the blade kind of meets the handle, okay. there's a little space. There's a kind of a, a curvature, a small opening. And something to relieve the pressure, or I'm, I don't know. You I'm could not keep a breath mint in there or something if you're in the middle of your axing. And exactly, you... a snack, you know, while yeah. you're on the battlefield. Yes, I'm not a blacksmith, so I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. This has been um, imagined in different ways. A and... subject of some controversy. Exactly. So what exactly this is? But it's it's some kind of small circle or opening in between. I always imagine kind of between the blade and the handle, and they set these axes up in a row, and so to shoot an arrow through all twelve of these things in a clean shot. Uh, an, an almost impossible feat of marksmanship. And strength. And strength. Because the arrow has to be going at a very right. high velocity. Right. And as we'll see, just even stringing the bow seems to be an impossible task. Right. So um, this is where it, it all goes down. And Penelope goes up uh, to retrieve the bro. The bro. <laughs> Not the bro. The bow. And bring it down for the contest. Right. And the description that Homer gives, as translated by Lombardo, where this bow is stored is really quite fascinating. It's fascinating and beautiful. It is. Right. A carpenter had planed off the threshold of oak. He had set the doors in place. There's a special key that Penelope uses. She inserts it into the lock. The key is made of bronze and ivory. The bolts slide away, or the tumblers, you know, within the lock. Yeah. And the doors whoosh open, and they make a sound. They make a sound, and there's fragrant clothing, and you can smell the cedar, you know, right. in this. It's, it's, it's beautiful. This reminds me of a question I often get from students is, is, why does Odysseus seem to care so much about stuff, right? It's I mean, so much is made about the, ta- the fine tables and, and the chairs and the bulls and the, the, the cows and, and the sheep. He said, we get that they're stealing his stuff, but why is that so enraging? Why is it so important? I think that's an interesting question. I think it is too. I, I, before you give us your answer, yeah, please. which I think is really good also, I think people are being a little bit disingenuous if they ask such a question. How so? Well, because I think it is the, the stated popular a notion that we're not supposed to be attached to belongings. Mm. Yeah, that indeed. We're, we're supposed to be generous, and I'm, I'm not materialistic. I love people more than things. And I agree that's a high and important principle, but I don't think anybody lives by it. Right. So when we see it in literature, it's very easy to condemn a person like Odysseus for being attached right. to the beauty of the hall where he eats. Mm. But let's be honest, we all really like our things. Of course we do, right. We, we like different things. Yeah. But we're very attached to the things that we like. It's just, it's really natural. Exactly. No, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think uh, what bothers the students is that they see that is, well, you know, how much of this is a pretext for murder? I see what right? you're saying. And that's fair enough. But I think you're right that um, you know, we, all like, we all like our stuff. Right. Well, so, and the sharp line between, I think this is where you're going, uh, the sharp line between possessions and people is maybe sharper than it ought to be. Hmm. Right. If someone insults something that my wife 
has made or something that's important to her, it's not really just an insult or a threat to her possession. Yeah. She's kind of connected to that in some way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. think about a, a meal, right? Um, someone comes over to share a meal and, and your wife or you and your wife, whatever, uh, create this meal and, you know, your guests say, well, I, I really um, enjoy your company, but this food's terrible. Yeah, 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 right. But it's not just the food. No, exactly, right. That's being insulted. Right, that's right on. And I like to remind my students, too, of, of I think you especially see it in the Iliad, this notion of possessions or spoils, uh, the physical object being tied to one's teammate or honor. Right. right? So, you know, the, the bigger your pile outside your tent, people say, oh, that guy's important. And so I think Odysseus' possessions in his palace are also indicative of, of kind of who he is, where he is on the totem pole. And so if you're slaughtering his flocks and you're, you're treating his stuff with irreverence, um, it's a direct attack on his honor. His teammate. His teammate. Right. Yeah. I think another effect that these kinds of descriptions have is they slow down the action. Hmm. But they slow down the action in a way that is delightful and not contrived. Yeah. You know, it's, it's connected to the action. In order to shoot the bow, to string the bow, to shoot the bow, you have to go retrieve the bow. But let's slow down the action a little bit and give this lovely description of where the object is stored. Yeah. Builds the sense of anticipation. Yes, right. It builds the, it builds the tension. And so and while that description of where the bow is, it's not one of his famous similes. It has that kind of kind of poetic air to it. It's kind of a fresh breath into the poetry. Yeah. Do, do you have some... Sp- special object that you enjoy, some special possession that you keep in, say, a velvet shoebox or something like that? Um, my guitar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I keep it in a, you know, I have a humidifier is in it there. A, is it a Gibson? Or? It is a Taylor. Taylor. That's yeah. a good one, isn't it? It's a middle mid-range guitar, but I'm... Would Scott Van Zandt play it? Um, he might sneer at it a little bit. Okay. But I've had it for over 20 years now, and it's probably the only object in my house that I would say is a prized possession. Okay. Yeah. How about you? Well, I like to keep track of the notes that people send me. I guess maybe my, my email archive would be kind of like Really? That. It's not physical, but also the handwritten notes that I've gotten from students and friends over the years. Yeah. At first, I would keep them all in a box. Um, you know, there, there can be quite a few, but I just kind of ran out of space. So now I take a photograph of it, right? And I, I keep a digital image so of you have it. A, a digital archive. Correct. Of, oh, I like that. Thinking I'll go Very back nice. and look at what people have said at different points in my life. Yeah. Um, but honestly... I'm not that I'm not that good at it, and uh, I need something like a guitar, you know, one one prized possession. But I really don't have anything that's equivalent. No kind of real like sentimental attachment attachment to objects. Are you a purger? Do you kind of like, oh, get rid of stuff? I yeah? am definitely a purger. Yeah, my wife is the same way. Right. Yeah. 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 But it doesn't mean that I'm not sentimental. It's mm. odd because uh, I am very sentimental in different ways. But I I don't collect objects so much. Interesting. Interesting. Well, back to the bow then, right? Uh, What is this episode about? (laughs) Is this about the Odyssey? It is about the Odyssey, right. Back to the bow. So um, Telemachus, he's he's champing at the bit. He he wants to kind of show his mettle and he wants to get this thing going. So he takes the bow and is about to string it. And, but Odysseus kind of gives them the nod um, and says, eh, you know, hold back, don't do it. Is it is it the third try or the fourth try? Right. And he's he's about to put it. He's about to do it. And Homer suggests that, you know, if he had had that one last try, he he would have done it. He would have been worthy of his father. Now, this is no ordinary bow, right? This is made out of animal horn, Mm -hmm. and it has its own backstory. What is the... Would you share that backstory? Uh, Sure. It's connected to the hero Hercules. Yes. It belonged to a man named Iphitus, whom Hercules killed, actually, in a kind of murder, which is a little bit of a foreshadowing of what Odysseus is going to do with Mm, the bow. Absolutely. And so um, it it was in Iphitus' possession. It eventually came to... Odysseus, but it has this connection to Hercules, which is significant. Yeah. If you read a lot of Greek mythology, Hercules, is, his myths stand behind a lot of the other hero legends there. There's um, Greek poets like to make connections back to uh, Hercules Definitely. and the family of Hercules. The yeah. most popular uh, character in Without mythology. Without a doubt, right. And what about Laodice, the soothsayer? Right. So I, I, I made a note to kind of to call special attention to Laodice because he's one of these guys that this, you know, the argument about, you know, did the suitors all deserve uh, what they got? I think his story is, is interesting because Homer kind of, he drops one shoe here and in the next book he drops the other one. So Laodice, he's, 
he's not really a suitor. He's their soothsayer. I guess mm. every gang of guys comes with their own soothsayer, right? Um, I think so. I guess so. Do um, we have a soothsayer here in the vomitorium? We, we need one. Someone to say sooth? So, to, to soothe us. To soothe you when you're disgruntled, Dave. <laughs> I thought of it, by the way. Thought of the object? Yes, I did. And what is the object? Well, it's a memento, something that my mother made for her father when she was a child. It's an ashtray. An ashtray? Yes. An like, ashtray. A, like it was like a, a school art project? Kind yes. Of thing? Okay. And yeah. so it has a lot of sentimental value. Oh, nice, 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 nice. So that's like a guitar, right? Yeah. Same. Okay. same it, in it the, counts? I'm still in the club? Yeah, under the same umbrella. All Absolutely. Right. So uh, back to the soothsayer guy. Okay. Um, he makes kind of a half-hearted attempt to string the bow. And he, like some of these other characters, sees to, I guess as a soothsayer should, has kind of a sense of what's about to happen. And this is what he says, again, Lombardo. He says, friends, I'm not the man to string this bow. Someone else can take it. I foresee it will rob many a young hero of the breath of life. And that will be just as well, since it's far better to die than live on and fall short of the goal we gather here for, with high hopes day after day. You might hope in your heart, you might yearn to marry Penelope, the wife of Odysseus, but after you've tried this bow and seen what it's like, Go woo some other Achaean woman and try to win her with your gifts. And Penelope should just marry the highest bidder, the man who is fated to be your husband. He has a real clear sense of what's going to happen, doesn't he? He does, yeah. And he, he knows. kind of tells them, hey, clear out, because death is right around the door. Yeah. Right around the door. Right around the, door, right around the corner. Right yes. around the corner. Where, the, where there may be a door. Okay. Yeah. But he picks up the bow, and it's almost as if he can sense the... Uh, kind of the death in it, you know, the, the murderer's backstory of the bow is, mm-hmm. uh, is going to continue into the present. The object has some aura attached to it. Right. And in addition to aura, it has some lard. Yes, a lot of lard being Correct. used to, 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 to grease it up. I guess that's how you loosen up a bow. Well, Telemachus is about to succeed, but his mm. dad calls him off. Laodice says, nobody can do no. this. So the other suitors, they get out a tub of lard, which you might know is pork fat. Pork fat. And uh, using this oil, right, they heat it up and the, the oil penetrates the horn, which is what this bow is made of. Yeah. And the oil penetrates it and then they heat it up by rubbing it in friction and that softens the fibers of the bow. Yeah. And uh, this allows it to be bent more easily. Makes it more pliable. It reminds mm-hmm. me, I just bought my, my son a new baseball glove. Did you he, take he, out a pack of bacon? and You got to break that thing in, right? You do. You put a ball inside it and you tie it up with a rope and you place it under your mattress and you sleep on it. Is that what you do? That's what you do. I got to try that. We were, just, we were, you know, it's we were just, terribly uncomfortable. It sounds horrible, right? We, we were just, we were just beating it with a bat and kind of, you know, bending it back and forth to try to break it in. But what I needed was some pork fat. Right? Yes. And you need to uh, put a lot of that oil and rub it in. Yeah. Of course, that'd be terribly distracting if you're out in the middle of the of the game. It would, it would be. Yeah, the, not, the bacon is wafting oh, off the man. Nobody, mitten. nobody would want to play. Right. All right. They get all, get all hey, hungry. kids, stop chewing on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, does the spending of with the large does it, does it work? Does it not work for, for anyone except for Odysseus, who doesn't really need it? Right. So, um, it's it's going nowhere for these guys, and they're they're trash talking each other. They're mocking each other for being weaklings for not being able to, to bend this bow. But none of them, none of them can do it. And then Odysseus takes. Aside his crew, yes, Eumaeus, who already knows who he is, mm-hmm. and Philoetius, cowherd, yes, right? yep, and reveals his true identity. And he, what, what does he break out as the token of recognition? Once again, it's the scar. Okay, right, this famous scar that Eurycleia recognized, and for Philoetius too, it's kind of oh, it's the king is back. Each of right. them has a little piece of cardboard with the imprint of the scar on it, like a, a <laughs> color match that you'd get from your local. Home repair. And he, and he kind of holds it up next right. to it. Yeah, okay, yeah. Matches. That's him. <laughs> Is that how it works? Yeah, I think that's how it works. Exactly. Okay. Right. And so there's hugging and weeping. I don't know how they're doing this without anybody else know, noticing. Right? Well, I was struck by the fact that the scene of recognition between Philoetius and Odysseus, it's like the recognition scene between Eumaeus and Odysseus and Telemachus and Odysseus. Yeah. And Homer says the weeping would have gone on and on. Uh, had they not realized we have business to do. We got do. business to take care of, right. And I also think it's really interesting about how as, as the suitors fail one after another, what really bothers them is not so much that they're not going to be the one to marry Penelope, it's their, it's the blow to their their honor. Yes, it's, their arete. Their arete, and that's what really bugs them, that people are going to laugh at them, and they're, it, going, to, they're going to remember this. It's yeah. posterity. So the suitors now begin to say things that are ironic from the perspective of uh, you know, the reader, the audience, because they're saying things that are true about themselves. For example, we can't even string his bow. This is Eurymachus. Mm-hmm. We'll be laughed at for generations to come. 
Well, yes. yes, you're going to be laughed at. Yeah, we're still laughing at them now. Exactly. Right. And so, uh, our, our listeners will remember Eurymachus is arguably top one or number two suitor, right? Right after Antinous. Antinous, yeah. And then I love these words from Antinous that follows this up um, where Lamato translates. Antinous answered him, uh, oh, that'll, that'll never happen, Eurymachus, and you know it. Now look, today is a holiday throughout the land, a sacred feast in honor of Apollo, the archer god. This is no time to be bending bows. That was kind of a strange direction for Antinous to take. It's the perfect time to be bending bows. It's, the, it's, a, it's an Apollo festival. Yeah. You should be bending them left and right. So, so what's the irony here? Well, I mean, again, Antinous lives up to his name, you know, the idiot, the, right. not, the not-minded one. It's also right? cowardice, isn't it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's, a, it's a, an excuse to get out of the fact that none of them have the strength to complete the action. Oh, yes, right. So he's, but it's it's a terrible excuse. And it's, yeah, deeply ironic and and ridiculous coming out of his mouth. And then someone makes a suggestion that Odysseus string the bow, correct? Yeah. Hey, why not the beggar? He's Mm -hmm. here. Give him a try. And this is an opportunity for the suitors again to guffaw and laugh. Maybe thinking if people are, are, will laugh at the beggar, they'll forget about our inability to do it. But then Penelope makes a promise that even if he succeeds, she won't marry him. Yes. They have nothing really to worry about. She'll give him clothing, mm-hmm. a nice little reward, and send him happily on his way, but they don't need to worry that he's a legitimate threat. Does Penelope know his identity at this point? I, without a doubt. I would say that when she, when she announces the contest at the end of Book 19, she knows, because okay. she knows exactly how it's going to turn out. Hmm. Yeah, she's directing the, the, the play here. Yep. Can I read that part here about uh, when Odysseus actually strings the bow? Yeah, oh, that's great. Please. Yeah, so Odysseus, deep in thought this is right near the end of book 21, was looking over his bow and then effortlessly, like a musician stretching a string over a new peg on his lyre and making the twisted sheep gut fast at either end, Odysseus strung the great bow. It's really completed in just one phrase. Lifting it up, he plucked the string and it sang beautifully under his touch with a note like a swallow's. The suitors were aghast. That's great. It, it's a, it becomes a liar. I love, the, I love that detail. He plucks the string and it sends out this, this ringing note. Yes, and it's yeah. the sound of death. The sound of death. For all of them. <laughs> it is, yeah. And in the meantime, uh, Euryclea, she's locking the doors to the hall. She's, she's penning everybody in. And Philodius goes outside and locks the gates. Nobody is escaping. He, he locks the gates with a twisted rope of papyrus. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's really interesting detail. So it's go time now. Yep. The bow is strung. It's time for death to ensue. And we're on to book 22, the slaughtered suitors and the hung maids. Yes. So Telemachus is now, the uh, son is standing next to his father. And it, it's, like a, it's like an old kung fu movie. I mean, they're vastly outnumbered, um, but they do have the weapons. Uh, the, the, the weapons have been, they're hidden in a storehouse, um, but they're still, um, it's... What, a hundred to hundred against two? 118 against to two. To two. To Telemachus and Odysseus, against Telemachus and Odysseus. But don't forget, they also have Eumaeus and Philoetius, and most of all, they have... Athena. Yes, disguised as mentor. Yes. Whom, as we'll see in just a moment, the suitors insult. They insult the goddess Athena. They just don't get it. It's as though they want to die. They do, right? <laughs> so what happens to Antinous? Well, this is uh, he has a very fitting death. He's the first one to go, and Odysseus shoots him through the neck uh, with an arrow as he's gulping down um, a goblet of wine. So he picks up the wine goblet. In a, in a lightning flash moment, Odysseus draws, shoots. The arrow goes through His Antinous' neck. neck. The wine comes out the throat. <laughs> And the black blood comes out his nose. Yes. And it's a description worthy of a uh, battle scene from the Iliad. Absolutely. And, and we're back on the battlefield uh, uh, in, in many ways. Yeah. So, and, and it's just that detail of Antinous is so clueless with regard to what's about to happen that he's back to the table. Oh, it's time to take a drink. Take a drink. Yeah. <laughs> right. So he went down, kicking his uh, feet against the table as he went down, spilling the food on the floor, and the bread and the roast meat were fouled in the dust. It's a pretty pathetic way to go. Every little, every little detail. Yeah. Not a heroic death. No, not at and all. And then Odysseus monologues. He cries out. What does he say? He says, you dogs, you thought I would never come home from Troy, so you wasted my house, forced the women to sleep with you, and while I was still alive, you courted my wife without any fear of the gods in high heaven or of any retribution from the world of men. Now the net has been drawn tight around you. Mm, that's a wonderful 
powerful speech to begin the slaughter. Yep, that's, that's terrified, right? Eurymachus, now he's the number one man because Antinous is out of the way. He offers to pay back. Here's his pleading. No, have mercy, have pity. I think he promises uh, every man will give you 20 oxen, Yeah, Odysseus, and then you can have everything back. We'll just leave and pretend none of this ever happened. Right, but you can't restore teammate that no. way. No. Insulted honor cannot be repaid. Odysseus says, not if I had all the possessions, not just a portion, but mm. not if I had all the possessions of each one of you, would it count? Yeah. Because what you have done has to be avenged. Yes, 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 exactly. Now, Melanthius, this guy, I mean, this guy has it coming too. Um, he's still on the side of the suitors here, and he sneaks out a couple of times, and he's bringing weapons from the, the storeroom. Um, but the second time he does it, uh, Eumaeus and Philodius get the jump on him. and The they t- swine herd and the cow herd. Yes, right. and they, they hog tie him. Uh, they tie him to a board. And then they hoist him up. Right. And he hangs there all night. Right, to await his, as we'll see, very grisly fate. This is yep. a, very, a very brutal <laughs> way for him to get justice. Yes. So wh- what about the scene in the hall? Well, it's very Iliadic in it, its slaughter. It reminds me a lot of those, those latter books uh, where a- Achilles is kind of going crazy mm-hmm. in-, in the hall. And it's, it struck me as, as kind of, again, having kind of a resonance with the Cyclops scene. Yes, it's, it's uh, just just like in the cave. Now it's the suitors who are trapped in there. They can't get out. But they don't have his versatility. They don't. They don't have his cleverness. Uh, but it also, again, if you follow that that line of thought, it puts Odysseus into the Cyclops role. Mm-hmm. He's going to slaughter um, the intruders into his space. Yes, but we know Cyclops bad. Odysseus good. I did, well, we, didn't we complicate that, Alyssa? A you little tried. Bit? I tried. You tried, and I was successful. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. So, um, Role reversal, then, right. you're saying. But I think there's enough similarities uh, here that I think Homer wants us to, be, to hear an echo of that scene. And okay. at least to think about you know, what, what kind of man is this that's, doing the, it, it, that's um, committing these acts. So the suitors get, they get picked off one by one. Mm-hmm. And they're named. Yes. And eventually, uh, Odysseus runs out of arrows. He has them all uh, set out before him. He's... He's uh, picking up an arrow, he's notching it and sending it off his wing against a, uh, you know, a suitor and it hits its mark. Eventually he runs out of arrows, but thankfully they have another supply of weapons. They have four shields, they have four helmets, each one has two spears. They're, 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 they have their, yeah, their, uh, their backup stash. And yeah. what happens to Ctesippus, the guy that was tossing around ox hooves? Well, he gets it. He gets what's coming to him. Um, and hooves, he's, ox hooves? Ox hooves, okay. yeah, right. So he gets, uh, he pays for that um, insult. And uh, he gets a uh, uh, he gets speared. He I gets believe. what behooves him. Oh, yeah, I should have I should have known that was coming. You should have seen it coming. <laughs> right, right. And there's uh, a, a wonderful uh, Homeric simile uh, again takes us to the world of nature to um, talk about what's happening in the hall. Are you going to read that? I will. Yeah. So like vultures with crooked talons and hooked beaks descending from the mountains upon a flock of smaller birds who fly low under the clouds and over the plain, the vultures swoop down to pick them off. The smaller birds cannot escape. And men thrill to see the chase in the sky. So that's what it's like. That's what it's like. It's like uh, vultures with crooked talons. Yes. On a flock of smaller birds. Yeah. And then Laodes shows up again. Remember that guy? Our soothsayer, right? Yes. You warned us to keep him in mind. I did. He right. tried to string the bow, but he said, nah, I'm not really going to do it. It's, this bow is, uh, it portends the death of many heroes. Yes. And so he, he urges the suitors to go off and marry somebody else, mm-hmm. right? But it's, of course, it's too late. So now it's his turn. All right. And um, Homer, via Lombardo, says, It was then that Laodes the soothsayer rushed forward and clasped Odysseus's knees and begged for his life. Now, that action of clasping the knees of someone who is before you uh, that's about to kill you is a posture that is, at least from what I have learned and read, Protected by the gods. Yes, it's classic supplication. Yep, you're throwing you're throwing away your honor. Grab in that the moment. knees. Usually, you touch the face. Yeah, you so yeah, clasp the knees and touch the face. Yes, right? this happens in Euripides uh, Hecuba, where Hecuba, the queen of Troy, um, pleads with Odysseus yes. for mercy by touching his face. That's right. That's right. I always tell my students, don't do this. But if you want some mercy on the exam, you know, you have to. <laughs> Supplicate properly? Right. Yes, right, right. They don't do that, thankfully. (laughs) So he begs for his life, and this is what he says. He says, By your knees, Odysseus, respect me and pity me. I swear I have never said or done anything wrong to any woman in your house. I tried to stop the suitors when they did such things, but they wouldn't listen, wouldn't keep their hands clean, and now they've paid a cruel price for their sins, and I, their soothsayer, who have done no wrong, will be laid low with them. That's the gratitude I get. Hmm. Now, we don't have a lot of backstory on Laodice, but I think it's interesting that in the previous book, Homer mentions him and, again, gives him 
a little bit of insight to what's about to happen. And so I, I don't know if he if he ever did anything wrong to any woman in the house, but he, I think he's he's a sympathetic character in this moment. Um, at least he's I think he's one of those guys on the fringe, like Infinimus, Im- mm-hmm. that maybe he's. This doesn't get him any credit, though. It, it's guilt. It's that kind of very weak guilt by association, yep. right? But so, I think if we look at how Odysseus responds, this is, I think this is key. So yeah, Odysseus scowled down at the man. Can yes. I read this Yeah, part? please do this. And yeah. said, if you are really their soothsayer, as you boast you are, how many times must you have prayed in the halls that my sweet homecoming would never come and that you would be the one my wife would go off with and bear children to? You're a dead man. As he spoke, his strong hand reached for a sword that lay nearby, a sword Agelaus had dropped when he was killed. The soothsayer was struck full in the neck. His lips were still forming words when his lopped head rolled in the dust. That's a very gruesome, Iliadic detail. It is. Right. So... um, This bothers you? It does bother me. I think Odysseus, he's not right. And what he says about Laodice here, he's making assumptions. Well, I feel like we don't have enough, I think I should say. I think we don't have enough information to draw that conclusion. I think he's still, he's painting with a, a broad brush in his rage. And so I think that one of the, one of the ways that you might, we might look at the end of the Odyssey is to read it against the end of the Iliad. Isn't Odysseus kind of being overcome with Manon, mm. rage like Achilles is, but without a safety valve to kind of let it go? And so he sees everything through this kind of this rage-filled lens that he can't, he can't, um, he can't bring any kind of nuance to uh, to, to the ending. Now, you, I mean, you could argue that, I mean, what are you going to do in the hall? Well, yeah, I'm going to save you and, and kill you. I mean, there's, there's a kind of a, a brutal practicality about right. just having to deal with everyone in the room. But I think his words, they're, they're troubling in, in a way. So how about the way that he deals with Phemius, though, the bard? Oh, when uh, he saves the bard. Right. And he does so because Telemachus uh, puts in a good word for him, right? Um, I mean, he's, a, he's about to kill Phemius. But doesn't that suggest that Odysseus is teachable because... Whereas with Laodice, Telemachus doesn't say anything. That's a good point. With with the bard Phemius or Phemius, Telemachus vouches for him and says, "No, Dad, he's really telling the truth. Yeah, uh, don't let him go." Oh, fair point. And, and then Phemius is saved. He's saved, right? And I or think maybe a, it's just that Homer is partial to the bard. Oh, yes, yeah, so there's, there's a nice little kind of nod and a wink there. That's, right. that's great. But that no, that's a that's a very fair response uh, to this. Uh, there's a handful of these characters that I think Homer does want us to see that. Well, may, maybe all the suitors are pinned by Athena and they're guilty by association, they are not all the same. Hmm. And if we put them all in just kind of one basket, like Odysseus seems to be doing in right. his response to the Odys, then we're missing something. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, a, all, that's all I got to say about that. That's a fair point. Okay. I'm right. sold. So now all of the suitors have pretty much been dispatched with. The bodies are piled up. Mm-hmm. Odysseus stands there. Eurycleia comes in. He's covered with gore. He's covered with spattered blood and yeah. all of this. And where do they take vengeance next? Well, now it's the it's the maid's t- uh, turn here. This is that this is that scene that uh, bothered Margaret Atwood uh, mm-hmm. so much, um, and I too also find it. I don't quite know what to to make of 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 the scene. I have one answer after we get through it. Okay, it probably won't be satisfying. Okay, all right, I have one all right. Answer. Sure. So uh, let me just read from Lombardo to to set this up. So he says, Odysseus t- called Telemachus and the two herdsmen and spoke to them words fletched like arrows. So even the, the words are fletched, right? Start carrying out the bodies and have the women help you. Then sponge down all of the beautiful tables and chairs. And when you've set the whole house in order, take the women outside between the roundhouse and the courtyard fence, slash them with swords until they have forgotten their secret lovemaking with the suitors, and then finish them off. Mm. So I, I think what's striking here is basically Odysseus tells them, don't just execute the maids, torture them. And then finish them off. Well, and first make them clean up the mess. Oh, yes. That's the scene that often gets my, my students. They get, he gets one last act of housekeeping out of them. Yes. Right. So I watched this uh, YouTube uh, short recently. Hilarious. So funny that I sent it on to some others. I suppose it can be looked up. You, you may not like it, but this man breaks into um, a, he's a criminal. He breaks into an auto repair shop. And he's trying to steal something. And there's only one person in there, the owner, who's working on his vehicle. He's trying to steal something. Well, the owner turns the tables on him and uh, pulls a firearm on the intruder. And then he compels the intruder to clean the entire vehicle. (laughs) 
uh, while he has this this uh, pistol drawn on him. So the owner, I mean the uh, the intruder, you know, who's going to perpetrate this crime, yeah. vacuums and cleans out the entire vehicle. It's all time lapse, so you don't have to you know. see all the all the details Correct. of it, right? Yeah. And then of oh. course the police arrive and take the guy into custody, but not before you know the the would be criminal has to uh, do all of the work that the uh, the owner was going to do. Himself. Wow, wow. So this seems highly analogous. Yes, absolutely. You need to send that to me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I one t- last round of housekeeping. One last round of housekeeping, and I, I find it so chilling, right? You you have to, I mean, you don't have to, but you know, I imagine the maids feeling what's about to happen, sure, right? And so, and they're carrying out the bodies of these men that they've been, you know, um, cavorting with and, and the like. But what I also find really interesting is that Odysseus tells him, says, "Son, do this." And then he leaves. And Telemachus says. And Telemachus says, mm, you know what? Doing something different. I'm doing something different. Right. And so he says, again, Lombardo, I won't allow a clean death for these women, the suitor's sluts, who have heaped reproaches upon my head and upon my mother's. He spoke and tied the cable of a dark proud ship to a great pillar, and he pulled it about the roundhouse, stretching it high so their feet couldn't touch the ground. Yeah. And so these, thus these women, their heads hanging in a row, the cable looped around each of their necks. It was a most piteous death. Their feet fluttered for a little while, but not for long. That's terrible. Isn't that terrible? That is highly disturbing. So, right, and I'm trying to think Maybe of, we should put uh, a kind of a warning on this, uh, in all seriousness. Yeah, Because no. there are some kids that listen to this. Right. This is a gruesome way to go. It's a gruesome way to go. And um, I do think that there's a distinction that these are women being killed, right? I mean, Odysseus says earlier, there's a quote that we read that when he's lashing against the suitors, that they forced these women to sleep with them. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to think of another place in the mythological corpus where the slaughter of women is justified mm-hmm. in this kind of way. And I think like like Atwood, this is a trouble this is a troubling scene. Hmm. And the fact that a Telemachus decides to show a little creativity. He says, right. I'll, I'll kill them, Dad, but not in the way that you suggested. I don't know. And is it this rage that's taken over? And then when it's immediately followed by what they do to Melanthius, yeah. I mean, if a guy who has it coming, it's, I don't know, a bridge too far? It's, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to this. Uh, it's just, all I'm saying is that this is a scene that you, you never see this scene in any kind of movie version. No, you right? have a very visceral reaction to it. Yes. My answer was going to be that this is retributive justice. Right, the lex talionis, the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, Mm -hmm. which would have been, I believe, the only kind of justice rather than the therapeutic kind, which is popular today, Yeah, wherein you try to restore the wrongdoer. Yes. Um, Retributive justice would have been really the only kind that the ancient Greek society or the Homeric society would have uh, appreciated, acknowledged, and practiced. But of course, a a counter-argument to that is the whole basis of retributive justice is that the punishment has to be proportional. Hmm. And this does seem out of proportion. Yeah. So I've come around hmm. to your view a okay. little bit. A little bit, yeah, yeah. This is out of proportion. Uh, clearly, they should have been punished in some way. But as you as you quoted, Telemachus says, I won't allow a clean death for these women. Yeah. So it can't just be some kind of fairly painless punishment. It has to be a gruesome, horrible, torturous death. A horrible death. You know, in some ways, even the suitors get a almost a kind of battlefield death. I mean, they're, they don't really have weapons to defend themselves. but no, because it, they've been disarmed. But It's a cleaner death, you're right. a quicker death. So I don't know fully what to make of it. You know, I don't, I don't think an ancient audience would have been haunted like, by this no. scene like Margaret Atwood Sensibilities is. Sensibilities are different. It's a, but it's still, it's a difficult scene. It's a difficult scene. So what happens to Melanthius then as we, uh, as we wrap up? Right. It's, it's literally the, it's the next paragraph. You're right. They descend upon this guy who's, again, remember, tied to a board, hoisted up. Yep. And so they brought Melanthius outside. Can I read that portion? <laughs> Please do. Yes. Uh, I don't want to read sh- it. I'm not sure I'm going to read all of it. <laughs> okay. And in their fury, they sliced off his nose and ears with cold bronze. Mm-hmm. And they pulled his genitals out by the root, mm. raw meat for the dogs, and chopped off his hands and feet. Yeah. It's 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 a it's a rage it's a fury that they descend upon uh, him right, and this is right on the heels of, of the hanging of the maids. I'm grimacing. It is yes. How can you not? Yeah. Uh, from those. So again, Melanthius. You know, we know that he's got it coming. He's one of the most despicable characters in these these latter books. But again, here too, over the top. I don't. I don't know. So it's, you asked the question at the beginning: Have we been influenced by? Judeo-Christian notions of mercy and compassion. Yes. I hope so. But <laughs> the question is, do any of those apply here in this strict sense of retributive mm. justice? Right. This is how I teach the epic. 
and I guess we're getting a little bit into what will be in the next episode, mm-hmm. namely how does you know, what does it all mean? But I, I try to draw this contrast for my students. Most of them are functioning with the concept of therapeutic justice. Yes, I will definitely use that when mm-hmm. I teach this from now because I think that's a a, a line that needs to be. Drawn, right. right. And, and they often think I'm advocating for retributive justice. <laughs> they do? <laughs> well, yeah, no surprise. But I guess I'm more just saying, look, there, there's more than one kind of justice. Mm. It, it would be unfair to these people to import into their world our own sense of what's right and wrong. Right. At least, you know, at the beginning of our interpretation or evaluation. Mm-hmm. I think there's also an aspect here of uh, that even as awful as the suitors are, they're still nobles. And so they, they get a cleaner death. The maids, Melanthius... These are a very low. They're not high on the social scale. You're exactly saying. right. And so it's more sure. justifiable to, to kill them in this way, perhaps. But from it, our perspective, of course, that makes it even worse. It makes it right, right. Compounding kind of <laughs> elitism with a grisly death. Right. But it's, it's key to read these as epics as best we can uh, from an ancient perspective, mm-hmm. as much as we can recover that. So the book ends with a, how do you describe it? A much needed fumigation? Yeah, he sets up the bu- you know, the, the bug bomb. Right. It's stinking with um, reeking of death, spattered with blood. And so we need to clean this place up. Yeah. And on that note, we look forward next week to uh, episode, whatever it is, 37. 37, yeah. yes. And yep. uh, we're going to wrap it all up with books 23 and 24. Yeah. Looking forward to it. I'm juiced up now. I'm excited about it. You know, no Odyssey fatigue on my end. Well, I wouldn't say I have it either, but yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I'm smarting a little bit from the, all the gruesome violence yeah. of uh, this terrible butchery that just took place. So we'll see if this if this thing ends on an up note. You're right. Yeah. So we got to say thanks to Mishka. As always. Our wonderful sound engineer, Intrepid, putting this all together. Thanks to the gentlemen, the incredible musicians, uh, Ken Tamplin, Scott Van Zen, who provide us this music. Yes. And um, Dave, tell us about the Moss Method. Oh, yes. Expert, accessible, self-paced. Go to mossmethod.com. You can learn to go from neophyte. To erudite. That's right. It's a uh, Cost $299. What a way to spend your summer learning some Greek so that the things we talk about, you can access them directly in their own language. That sounds great. And, and how can they find this? Mossmethod.com. M-O-S-S. Excellent. Method.com. So please subscribe. Uh, leave a review on your favorite podcast site. You can send mail to jeff at ad nauseum.com. Don't forget the V if you want to compliment him on his sparkling literary analysis. Please do. If they want to uh, leave me some criticism, where should they send that? Uh, or praise. You don't like either of those, right? No. <laughs> yeah. Send it to dave at ad nauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Yeah. Check out the website. Check out our merch. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And Jeff. Yes. You have the gustatory parting shot. I do. This comes from James Patterson, a prolific author whose books I've only really seen on racks in airports. But uh, you haven't read them? Is that what you I've, I've never read a James Patterson book. You know how you yeah. can tell when you have arrived as an author? How? When the uh, font size of the author's name on the cover is larger than the font size of the title. <laughs> That's Mr. Patterson. Yeah, uh, nobody <laughs> cares the title of the novel. Right, right. His name is on it. Yeah, that, I like that's very well said. Well, this is also what he had to say. Popcorn for breakfast? Why not? It's a grain. It's like grits, but with high self-esteem. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.